Uh, first of all, uh, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me and uh, for the stalwarts that are sticking around, recognizing that there's nothing between you and home but traffic. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I was just uh, joking with Leroy. My option is just to talk till about 8 o'clock and let you avoid that if you'd like. And, and for me, that's not a problem, so I'll warn you. But uh, again, thank you. Um, I found uh, the, the, uh, the presentations throughout the day um, quite prolific and, and really, I think, tying into a lot of the themes that I, I'm intending to talk about. Um, I'll try to do this in, in probably about half an hour, 40 minutes, and leave some questions at the end and, and hopefully allow everybody to get out of here. So uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions if you, if you want as we go through this. Um, first of all, just by way of background, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, um, but Providence Health and Services, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with us, we're quite large. We're the um, third largest not-for-profit system in the country, uh, headquartered out of uh, actually technically Renton, Washington, just outside Seattle. <clears throat> um, many of you might in this area know that uh, we've now announced uh, an affiliation that's forming with St. Joseph's uh, of Health right here in Orange. Yeah, woohoo. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, but I wanted to point out, because of course we're talking to an audience uh, that, that has an interest in, in IT and, and, and it is HIMSS. Um, we are also, I don't, I'm not sure why that's flashing a little bit, but I'll try to bear with it, I apologize. Um, we are, I believe it's technically the second largest EPIC implementation in the world uh, behind Kaiser. Um, so we've made a very, very large investment in EPIC. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that um, today. We're going to be talking about some of the other parts of the organization. Um, the EPIC deployment um, support and whatnot within the organization uh, is all managed under the um, uh, the rubric, if you will, or the, or the department of what we call 1IS. Um, so we have uh, uh, coalesced various IT departments from across our um, what we call ministries, our hospitals, uh, and our regions um, that cover a five-state area into one large organization now. Um, that organization, that department, is roughly 2,500 employees. Uh, probably half of them are effectively in the Seattle area. The rest are scattered throughout the, the states that we're in. Um, but you can see some of the, I know that the, the font here is a little too small to read, but um, some of the metrics on the left uh, give you an idea of the, the kind of organization we are, um, the size. This is about two years old, I think, this data. But we're roughly now about 100,000 employees um, entirely. Uh, this reads about 76,000, uh, I believe. Um, and as I say, we are the second largest uh, Epic user. One of the things we, we started to do a number of years ago is, um, and some of you may be familiar with this concept, something called um, Community Connect, where we are now making Epic available to smaller institutions that would not on their own be able to, to afford to either license it or more, more substantially implement it. Um, and we've started to amass quite a footprint of, of partnerships and alliances with organizations um, who are unaffiliated to us. They are entirely independent entities, uh, both in the form of hospitals and clinics um, through our deployment of EPIC. But again, this is not something I, I was uh, I'm intending to focus on, but I just wanted to give you a background um, that, that we are very proud of what we do, we've done with EPIC, continue to do with EPIC, and it has started to create a foundation on which we can do innovation in, in new ways, and that's really what I what I want to talk about. Um, so moving on, does anybody, if you can make out this image, have a, want to hazard a guess what this might be? HIMSS conference? That's not a bad guess. I'd say that's probably the line for the washroom at the HIMSS conference, but <laughs> any other guesses? I won't belabor the point. So this is the introduction of Pope Benedict the 16th back in 2005. In and of itself, not interesting. But when we want to talk about innovation and, and the pace of change, I would fast forward eight years. <clears throat> I think it's pretty apparent what the message is here and how fast things are changing. And we've talked a bit today about you know, the ubiquity of, of, of technology and how it's arriving in everyone's hands um, and the capabilities that, that that's unleashing upon us. Um, another little anecdote to, to kind of tee up the conversation, and again, I'm not sure why this is flashing. I don't know if there's anything. May not be able to, may not be able to fix that. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Two different companies. Um, if, if you can't tell, we're looking at time on the x-axis, and the y is revenue. Anybody want to guess what companies we're looking at here? Blockbuster was a bricks and mortar company. It owned stores on the corner everywhere. They became somewhat ubiquitous in and of themselves. And they recognize that, they claim that to be one of their greatest barriers to competition. 
They were in every community. Nobody could come in and take our spot. <clears throat> Netflix comes along and with only a billion dollars in revenue completely crushed them from five billion to virtually nothing in a very short span of time. How many of you work for organizations that are hospital based? Lots of bricks and mortar. You should start getting nervous. <laughs> I've been having a number of conversations today um, out in the corridor with a, a number of people uh, talking about some of the things I've seen in different parts of the world and, and one of the, the stories I talk a lot about is the UK. Um, I know that we see in the news from time to time, particularly when um, uh, Obamacare was making its way through the political process, uh, things happening in other countries and you would see images, for example, of hospitals with broken glass and, and looking di di dilapidated and, and not maintained, um, which is the truth. They were dilapidated, they were not maintained because they had not been used for years. Those hospitals had been shut down years ago. And if you go to the UK today, they have far fewer hospitals per capita than they did only 20 years ago. And the reason is because they've completely restructured the way the health system is working. And it's not just digital that's enabling that, they are still somewhat bricks and mortar, but they started doing this recognizing that the way we do healthcare is going to change. We can't continue to do care the way that we have in the past. And so um, when we look at how things are changing, um, one of the fundamental things that, that's in transition, and again, there's been a lot of talk about this. We talked about macro and, and other things throughout the course of the day. Um, historically, we have been either, and I've been, I'm going to be generous with the, the image on the left here, um, and I can't claim that I created this. Um, I don't know what the source is, but this did come off the internet, so you can probably see this if you go searching for it. But um, I'm, I'm going to be generous in saying that the insurer was at the center of care, um, has been historically. And if you just think about it in terms of pre-approvals, pre-authorizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what's covered, what's not, you can see the reasoning behind that. Um, another way of looking at this might be to actually put the physician at the center of this. Largely the way we have provided care, understandably so, has been very physician-centric. Well, if you fast forward, not just in the context of what's happening with the um, Affordable Care Act, uh, meaningful use, all of these other things, but again, on a global basis, what's happening is we are shifting to the point where now the patient is at the center. And we talked a bit about patient engagement um, a bit earlier. Um, there were some, some concepts that were, that were brought up and it would have been great to have a full day to talk about patient engagement. Uh, but I think we are just scratching the surface on this concept of patient engagement. And to that end, let me give you some statistics to look at. The majority of you are probably familiar that we're seeing a transition to more high deductible plans. We as individuals are now being expected to carry more of the risk, the financial risk for our health. And that in and of itself is interesting, but if you look on the right, and again, I know that the font's a bit small, what it's showing is that as a result of that, we are foregoing care. We are not getting the care we need because we have to pay for it now. <clears throat> So if you're a hospital, how are you going to stay in business in 10, 15, 20 years? If you're a physician, what are you going to do? And it gets worse. As you start to look at the data even further, you start to see things like patients demanding generics when the physician is even saying, no, I want you to have the brand name. So now you've got patients that are actually contradicting what the provider is telling them to do. You've got patients making decisions. I'm supposed to take these three pills. I can't afford all of them. I'll take one every other day. So they're changing the actual clinical protocols that are happening on their own because they've gone and researched it. We used to have, and it was mentioned earlier today, the scenario where the patient is showing up at the physician's office with a stack of papers that they printed off the internet or seeing the ads from the, from the Super Bowl saying, I want this medication. It's even worse. They're now getting actual prescriptions and protocols given to them, care plans, and they are modifying them on their own. And it's largely because of the financial transition. The other thing is because they can. They now have access to other sources of care, and that leads to the point on the right where patients are now saying, hey, if it's going to cost me $3,000 out of pocket for the hip replacement through Kaiser or Sutter or uh, Providence or, or anybody else, why don't I just go to, I don't know, France and have it done for $3,300? I get a vacation out of it. They're going to let me rehab in a, in a hotel there. Why would I stay here? We are under threat as an industry because of this transition to patient-centered care. This is not, it would be neat if we could try these apps and we could do these things. We view this as a threat to our business. 
And as a result of that, um, and as an extension of a number of the things that we see happening in the industry, again, the transition from fee-for-service to value-based, <coughs> um, and the focuses, uh, or the foci that are, that are shifting um, from, from encounters to outcomes, all of that, Providence and the board of directors recognized this transition, this trend, starting about three, four years ago. And so they proactively decided, rather than wait to see what was happening and be whipped around, rather than do things like meaningful use because the regula regulatory bodies say we should do it, they said, how should we reinvent our business? If, we are going, if we're going to do care, as we have for the last 150 years, because that's how long Providence has been around, the same way for the next 10 years, we will be gone in the 11th year. They see this as that big a threat, the board of directors. And so it becomes a real interesting challenge that again has been talked about in, in, in different contexts throughout the, the day. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How, how do you continue to generate revenues and pay your physicians and your nurses and pay the bills to keep the lights on at the hospital at the same time that you are trying to shut down the hospital? It's a really interesting paradigm. So what the board did was they actually went out, <clears throat> they recruited an individual, the gentleman's name is Aaron Martin. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Aaron. Aaron was the business lead at Amazon for the development of the Kindle. This is the, the technology that literally decimated the publishing industry. It destroyed it. We as consumers think of it, hey, it's cool, I can get a book on a tablet now. That's great. But what it means is we no longer need to print. So all of those businesses out there, those bricks and mortar printers, are really threatened. Most of them are gone now because we don't need to print anymore. This was all created by the Kindle. The vision of the Kindle was not to decimate that industry. The vision was to make it easier for us as consumers to consume books. And so the artifact of that effort was, the, like I say, the decimation of an industry. So Providence set out to do a similar type of disruption, and they created what we call the Digital Innovation Group. Aaron was brought in to lead this. He was given, <clears throat> well, I should first of all mention, he is, um, as his title shows, a senior vice president within the organization. He reports directly to our president. He is on the same plane within the organization as our chief medical officer, as our CIO, as our CFO, as everybody. And his purpose is to make their lives hell. Pardon my French. <laughs> he is here to disrupt. He is here to question why we do things the way we do. Now, they get to push back and say, well, because if we don't, we're going to decimate the $25 billion of revenue that comes into our organization, that could be a problem. So there's a constant back and forth, but he is intentionally there to ask that question and create that tension. He was given $150 million to set this department, this division of the, of the business up. And the intent of, of the disruption is not just for disruption's sake. It is fundamentally to create a tighter bond, a tighter relationship between Providence and our patients. If you think about not only Providence's history, but I would contend all of your organizations as well, the customer at the end of the day, in the boardroom, in the minds of the board members and the senior executives, the customer was the physician. This is what resulted in the Stark Laws, because organizations started sucking up to the physicians, giving away free things to induce them to bring transfers and admissions into their facilities. The customer was the physician. Secondarily, there was another customer that was the payer. The patient was an afterthought. They came along because of, was because of the behaviors of the physicians and the insurance companies. And when Aaron came in and sat down with the board and talked this through, one of the questions that our CEO asked him very specifically early on in the process, before he was even hired, is if you were going to attack Providence, how would you do it? And the response was simple. I'd go after your patients because you don't have a relationship with them. And it was, it was a, sen a seminal moment for the board when he presented that to the board because they said, you know, you're right. <clears throat> and I would challenge all of you to think about that in the context of not only your daily lives but your organizations in general. Are you doing these things because the technology is cool, it's neat, it can, it can do neat things, or is it because there is a bigger intent because of the things I'm talking about? This is survival that, that we're, as we see it, that we're, we're looking at. 
Um, we have a, a mantra, it's, part of, it's actually part of our vision statement that we use at Providence, um, and, and you can see it at the bottom there. It's know me, care for me, ease my way. And that is part, as I say, of our vision statement. You'll notice it doesn't say for patients. It's for everyone, physicians, nurses, patients, allied health professionals, administration, everybody. It is in the DNA, the ethos of Providence, that what we do should be to either create more knowledge about an individual, an ability to care for them in a better way, for example, make sure that our nurses are not being burned out, as was mentioned in one of the prior sessions, or to just simply ease the way for people. And that includes patients. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we're doing this and, and how we're utilizing disruption and, and, and digital technology to accomplish that. Uh, whoops. <clears throat> we look at innovation as going through generally three phases. And this is, this is born a lot out of uh, work that was done by um, not only Amazon, but the likes of Google, um, uh, Uber, uh, as well as um, smaller startups. And, and it really permeates in the work we're doing. The first is recognizing that in most cases, a pilot project, a product, uh, project starts out. And it typically is based in this concept of answering the question, can we use technology to fill in the blank? And I'm going to use telehealth as an example a bit later, so I'll, I'll, I'll start introducing that theme now. Can we use a camera and a microphone to connect a patient and a physician? And that's where a lot of projects have started. How many people have, have done pilot projects in that context? Right? Could we use Fitbit to monitor our diabetics? And so we go off and we start these pilot projects. But the focus is on the technology. Will the technology enable us to do this? And sometimes we're fortunate enough, and I contend based on my experience in, in innovation over 30 years in healthcare, it's probably more luck than by design. We're getting better at it, but it's typically lucky that when we look back and see what were the results of that pilot project, we may see data that not only shows that the technology worked, it was safe. It may have actually been efficacious, but did we get enough data to actually say, what would this do to the business if we were to deploy this? If we were to scale this across all of our patients, what would be the impact? And so <clears throat> that gets into the second phase, which is the analysis phase. And unfortunately, what happens in many cases is you do that pilot project with the focus on the technology. We answer those basal questions of will the technology work. We start to do the analysis and we do the we never got a baseline before we started the pilot. So we got to go back and start again. And maybe we learned a little bit of something in the pilot, so we make some, some tweaks to it, and that's great. Um, but then we go forward and we then analyze, and hopefully we see some results that come out of it that say, yeah, that was pretty good. And it looks like it will save money and actually improves outcomes. That's great. Now how would we scale this? And what ends up happening is the technology you chose and the way you implemented it won't scale. And I don't mean scalability purely from the technological perspective. Can we have X number of concurrent users and will the servers support it? That is one element of scalability. But how do you operationalize this as a business? For example, if we were to use a wearable or a set of apps to improve the way we do chronic care, what are we going to do with all the free time that the physicians and the nurses in the primary care clinics now have? <laughs> and I'm not kidding. It's one thing to say that you're, they're going to lose income for those patients who now have their diabetes under control. They don't need to be met with as frequently. And because of telehealth, I can meet with them virtually now, which CMS won't pay for yet. How do you scale this? Right? So <clears throat> what we're doing is we're asking those questions right at the pilot stage. We're recognizing that there is no point in proving that the technology is efficacious unless there is a plan to scale it. Otherwise, all we do is get people all excited and worked up, and then we sit there and we wait. And we wait and we wait. How many of you had a demo of an EMR, like Epic or Cerner or something? How exciting was the demo? 
right? It's the same thing. The pilot effectively serves as the demo. And it's really difficult, I know, for organizations to contend with all the physicians and nurses that are coming at them with interesting ideas, particularly if they're coming to the IT department that's responsible for supporting the EMR or the EHR. And now we're trying to say, well, we don't have bandwidth to do this for you. And so that's why we've purposely created a separate organization to do this innovation work from the IT organization. Lots of intersections, lots of talking, and I'll give you some examples of that. But that should just give you kind of a foundational picture of how Provident is approaching this problem. We also are focused on decoupling, as I say, the problem from the solution. And the reason is, oftentimes, people will approach us, could be a physician, could be a nurse, could be a care coordinator, whatever the case is, could be another executive in the organization, saying, I saw this neat technology. It would be great if we did this. And there's such an emotional exuberance around that, that we race forward and, and not stop and say, yep, I can see the possibilities here, but what's the problem we're really trying to solve here? And what's the best way to solve that problem? The technology may be a part of it, that's, that's great. But there's so much, again, we talked a lot about it today, of this emotional exuberance around things like apps, like population health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say I snap my fingers and you have the perfect solution for population health. What are you gonna do with this? What, what problem is it solving? I mean, we can look at it and say, hey, we can, we can then be much more informed, we can more proactively provide support to our patients, we can get into more of a wellness model than a reactive, acute care-based focus model. That's all true. How are you going to get paid to do it? Nobody's paying you for wellness right now. It's one of the big challenges. The only way that we're going to get there is if we continue down the path of things like ACOs and, and value-based care, where now I am at risk for the financial outcomes of the patient. So it's great that we're making these investments in, po in population health, but let's make sure we align what we're trying to accomplish today with the problem we're trying to solve today rather than going off on these the theoretical things because what ends up happening is we build the technology. I'm a firm believer that technology is never the problem. We can build anything. I, real, I, I am a firm believer that the, 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 the brain trust that exists, not just in this country, but globally, to solve problems technically is not the barrier. The barrier is the business models and, and how we're applying that. And so if we don't really decouple that and understand the problem and really understand the value of solving that problem, we run into problems in doing these pilot projects and whatnot. <clears throat> and when I talk about the value in solving the problem, an example I use um, with, with my colleagues and, and my team, I could go to our CEO. We're, remember, we're about a $25 billion organization now. I could go to my CEO and say, I identified that we are wasting about $5,000 a year on X. What is he going to say to me? Who cares? It's $5,000. In the scheme of $25 billion, you just spent more than that in this conversation with me. <laughs> so if we don't understand the value of the problem we're actually solving, What's going to happen when we get through the pilot project, we do some analysis and say, look, it improved outcomes for the patients, and then we go to the physicians, and we haven't considered their problems, and the value of solving this problem to the physician, and now we say, you need to change the way you do everything. <laughs> Isn't that how we've rolled out EMRs, or tried to? <laughs> right? So we see these patterns over and over and over again. And so this is the, the bowl we're taking by the horns at Providence in the creation of the Digital Innovation Group and trying to focus our attention on things like meeting with the senior clinical stakeholders in the organization, saying, what are your problems? How can we ease your way? Let's understand the problem. And if we could solve that problem, what is that worth? Is it, is it worth the fact that you can now go home and spend time with your daughter at her ballet recital, or your son at the Little League game, as was mentioned before? Is that what's of value to you? And if we could do that, you would be more inclined to stay at Providence and not leave? We would be an employer of choice of yours? I can quantify that value. I can look at it and say, this will have the following impact on turnover of physicians and the cost associated with recruiting new physicians. I can quantify that value. If that's what we're trying to accomplish, now let's figure out how we do that. It may not just be putting a Fitbit on the patient, 
right? So it's really important that we understand the problem and, and the value that problem has. So the way we're accomplishing this within the Digital Innovation Group, there are three, three entities or three efforts within the group. Again, all of them reporting up to, to Aaron, as I described. One is we have something called Providence Ventures. This is um, not necessarily unique to Providence. Um, there are other organizations that are doing this, but effectively, Aaron has put together a team of what, what I'll refer to as investment bankers. Um, they, they, are, they are investment people that go out and look at making equity investments uh, in early stage companies. And it's not just because we think they may have the next Kindle and we could make a lot of money on it. It's because they have a technology, a solution, a tool that solves a problem that we are trying to solve, that we have identified as having value worthy of investing time and energy into. And as I like to say, again, not necessarily unique to us, but in this whole engine of innovation, our money is really smart money. Because I can give, or Aaron in, the, in this case, could give a million dollars to an early stage company just like any other investment banker could, but I can also take that product, put it in the hands of 5,000 physicians tomorrow, 25,000 nurses, and several hundred if not millions of patients instantly. So if you want to know how good your product is and how to develop the ROI for your product, my million dollars is going to get you there a lot faster than virtually anybody else's millions of dollars. And we have an infrastructure to do this. It's not just that we have a couple banking guys on the side that are willing to make investments and then try to find the clinicians and the mechanisms within the organization. This is what we're creating with the, the, the Digital Innovation Group. Second pillar, or, or leg of the stool, if you will, is what we call consumer innovation. And I'll give you some examples of, of this, what we're doing there in just a moment. I'm gonna go through some examples of all three of these. Um, but the consumer innovation, as, as I alluded to before, is all about creating apps, tools, efficiencies that create a tighter bond between Providence and our patients, most specifically as we identify between episodes of care. So it's, it's great that we can make things, for example, better for the patient when they are walking out of the clinic after an appointment by perhaps giving them some educational material, for example, or maybe giving them copies of their lab results. We're using MyChart, the portal, so they have access to that. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is if they don't have another appointment for six months, how do we remain relevant to them during that six months? How do we become top of mind for them that we are their source for anything having to do with their health and wellness and that of their families? That's the bond we're trying to create. And I'll give you an example of, of that in a moment. And then the third thing is what we refer to as just generally digital innovation. We have a development and technology group that's about, it's pushing about 100 people right now. Um, we are developing apps, we're developing um, tools that augment and supplement what Epic can do as well as all the other technologies that we have throughout Providence. We're doing some integration work. This is the group that really comes together with our IT department, our 1IS as we call it. Um, in, that, in that area, um, one of the, the core things that, that we are doing a, a massive amount of investment in is telehealth. And, and I'll give you an example of some of the stuff we're doing in, in telehealth in a, in a moment. So these are the three pillars of digital innovation um, in Providence. Here's um, a smattering of some of the investments that we've made and, and how we've identified the five key areas in our strategy around the investments that we're making. Um, just so you can read, if uh, hopefully everybody can see it, but I'll just read them across. The categories are chronic, uh, chronic disease management, uh, what we call healthcare e-commerce, on-demand on healthcare, which I'll describe in a moment, population health, of course, and then tools for the clinicians themselves. So we look at the investments as falling into those categories, and we have a series of problems that we're trying to solve under each one. Um, just as an idea, um, has anybody heard of Amada? I mean, they, they have a fairly good reputation. Um, it's a diabetes management app, succinctly put. Um, and so we've, we've actually made an investment in that. But one of the things we do is before we make the investment, we actually take all of these tools and we pilot them ourselves. We go through that pilot stage first to see, can we work with this company? Does the technology work well? Is there support mechanism in place? Is this someone we would be willing to invest in as a customer before we're willing to invest in them as an investor? And so we do that first. Usually it's about a six month cycle, typically for us using the tool in, in, like I say, these pilot projects. And if things go well, if we see some semblance of the ROI that's anticipated, if we see glimmers of solving the problems that we're able to solve in that early 
early pilot stage, we will invariably go ahead and make an investment and then try to influence what they're doing to accelerate that ROI and the, and the problem resolution. So OMADA is, is diabetes management. SCORED is interesting. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about Fitbit, pretty ubiquitous thing at this point. SCORED is a company that has developed a Fitbit for kids. And it's not just smaller. I mean, that, that seems kind of obvious. But they have done things in the design of the software um, and, and the way that the, the device works that's all intended to motivate children to be active. So for example, some of the things it does, um, first of all, entirely gamified. It's got a security infrastructure that um, the online app is controlled by the parents. Um, there is no uh, PMI that is disclosed from the children, but they can get into competitions with one another. I can walk up to my, my friend on the playground and we can bump our scores together. Whichever of us have had more activity, theirs will glow and vibrate. <laughs> so they can in real time have competitions throughout the day, right? So it's things like that. So that's scored. We've got, um, we've got two complete health uh, education systems, one in Anchorage, Alaska, and one um, in Puget Sound, just outside Seattle, um, that have put these on the wrist of every kid. And we're doing pilot projects with that to look at the impact. And the data is profound. It really, really is exciting to see what it's doing. It's not about, I, I would contend, and this is based on my four years prior to coming to Providence, being in the patient engagement space, I think this idea of knowing how many steps you've taken is kind of silly. And I'll tell you why. After about three months of knowing that, you know how many steps you took without looking at your wrist or looking at the app. So what you're doing with this tool is teaching yourself the awareness, okay? And I think that's probably true of many, many of these apps and things that are coming out. The, the golden egg, the golden jewel, if you will, for this whole area is behavior modification. How do you motivate somebody to change their behavior? You can tell me 10,000 steps is what I should be doing. If I keep doing 8,000, how is it helping me to tell me tomorrow I did another 8,000 steps? That you need to have that intersection where somebody comes in and motivates you and figures out why is it you are not willing to walk more and take more steps. What is in the way of that? And that's what we need to address, not just continue to beat on ourselves about the fact that you're not achieving the goal, right? So, and, and you'll see that in the data on many of these wearables. Many of you may be familiar with this data. Um, I'm a little off track, but I think it's important because it, it fits in with the, the scored conversation. Um, people stop wearing them after about three months. They run out, they buy them. There's a lot of emotional exuberance. I watch what's happening, and then the utilization just starts to tank. And, and the reason is because I now know if I took my 10,000 steps. I can tell from how I feel. Um, and so the question is, how do we take it to that next level? So the wearables are going to become ubiquitous. You know, everybody certainly put these things in clothing and shoes and everything. So it's not even going to be on our wrists anymore. It's about how do we as a health system start engaging with our patients in a way that we can motivate them based on the things that they need personally at an individual level to be motivated. Telling me to eat better and exercise more, I'm a pretty smart guy. I know I could stand to lose 20 pounds. My doctor knows that about me. He just looks at me now and just does this when I come in. <laughs> Doesn't even need to talk to me, right? Um, so the issue is not that I'm not aware. The issue is I'm not willing to change my behavior for some reason. And until he is incented to invest in figuring that out and solving that problem, me knowing how many steps I take or what I'm eating is not going to get us anywhere. So that's what I talk about, about the scalability. How does he get remunerated in such a way that supports that? How does he get the support? A physician is not the one that probably needs to motivate me. It could be a trainer. It could be a personal coach. It could be a whole bunch of different things that are a lower level license, if I can say it that way, than a physician. And that's how we have to restructure the system and our organizations to be able to embrace the technology to be effective in certain ways. And so that's what we're focused on. So SCORED, we think, is a, is a, is a real tool for that because they recognize that. They're looking at it saying the device is interesting and we can do some interesting stuff with the bumping and the glowing and the vibrating and that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, how do you motivate them? One of the things they're working on, we just hired a new CEO for that organization, is integration with the gaming consoles. So if you want to spend time on your PlayStation, you have to take X number of steps. Right? So it's, it's, it's like the connection between things like Fitbit and loyalty programs. We, it's all about the behavior change and the motivation 
that's happened. It's not just about the data. So that's SCORED. Um, <clears throat> Lyra, similarly, is a company that is focused on behavioral health. Not talking about psychiatry, we're talking more psychology and behavioral health type of stuff. You can see where we might start to connect these two things together as an organization, right? Um, moving to the, to the right uh, in the e-commerce e space, um, I don't know if you can really read that, but that's an investment we made in a company called Binary Fountain. Has anybody heard of Binary Fountain? Again, it's an early stage company, so I wouldn't be surprised if nobody's heard of it. They're focused on um, pulling data together. It's almost a data aggregation model, but it's not the conventional data you would be thinking of. It is looking at how our patients are scoring and commenting on our providers and pulling that data together. How many of you have gone and looked at uh, you know, the, 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 the star scores for providers um, and the feedback? And every site you go to, you get a different answer, right? So how do you make heads or tails in this new world where you are in control of your health and who is going to be providing care to you? How do you determine who's a good physician and who's not? And so this company is focused on aggregating that data and giving us analytics on that so we can really discern the trends and what's happening. Maybe the bad feedback for this physician comes from only one gender, or one age group, or one geographical location. And so we can start to look at what that is and how we might affect that. So that's, um, that's Binary Fountain. Um, Kairos is a company that is all focused on doing matching, um, physician and patient matching. And I'll talk about how we're using that in a moment. But when you are searching for a physician, this is a tool that can sit in the background and help you figure out who's going to be best for you. Moving to the right, on-demand healthcare. We've made an investment in a company called In Demand. It's an online audio and video translation service. It effectively falls under, the, again, the rubric of telehealth. It can be delivered on an iPad or a tablet of any kind on a cart. Um, but effectively, what you do with this is instantaneously, if I have a patient that needs some translation services, and the video is important because this includes American Sign Language, which means that this tool can actually help hospitals become compliant with the ADA. I choose the gender, the language I'm looking for, and within 30 seconds, you have a translator sitting there in the consult, watching and listening to what's happening to be able to provide communication between the provider and the patient bidirectionally, instantaneously. So that's in demand. We've not made any investments yet in the digital innovation group in population health. There are massive investments being made in our 1IS group and our marketing group around that. Um, but we're waiting for some of those foundational components to be put in place before we start putting on some of these new innovative things on population health on top of that. But the most recent investment all the way on the right with clinician tools is something called Gauss Surgical. It's an, bless you, it's an investment um, that we, uh, we made. Um, this is a company that actually has a technology, I believe they're right here in, in Orange County, if I'm not mistaken, um, but they've developed a, a device that goes into the operating room and it captures the blood that's being lost during the surgery and has a way of actually monitoring that so we can report in real time how much blood loss has occurred during surgery. So we can proactively be in front of that and preparing whatever's necessary to deal with that. We can alert the physician to the rate of blood loss is greater than we would expect, et cetera. So interesting technology in that regard. So that's just a real quick tour of some of the investments we've made. We follow a lean process, not only in our development, but also in our innovation as I've described. Fail fast. Determine that this is not going to work quickly. Get in and get out quickly. Um, and learn, 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 learn. It's more for us about learning than it is about doing it right. I know that sounds crazy, but if I were to go ahead and put a Fitbit on a group of patients, what do we learn from that? Well, we learned that you know, we have to get the providers on board, otherwise there's no point in doing this. Okay, well then stop. There's no reason to keep going forward until we get the providers on board, for example. So we're following that methodology. So let's talk about some of the things that we've started to develop. Uh, how many of you are with organizations using Epic, and, and in particular, my chart? Okay. Um, not, not an advertorial at all, but you'll probably be aware that my chart, of course, has the ability for a patient to request an appointment online through the, through the portal. That's all well and good if, in fact, you are a patient in Epic, and you already have a provider in that institution. What do you do if you just move to Southern California and you're looking for a doctor? 
So we've actually built a tool that wraps around my chart in Epic. And it uses that Kairos technology that will allow me to say, I am looking for a male phys family physician in this uh, zip code. This language is a first language, or these languages are second languages. These age groups, I can set up whatever criteria I want. And the system will come back. This, is, this can be surfaced right through Google and tell you, here are the Providence physicians that are available to you in that area. Here are the slots that are available on the calendar. If you'd like, just click one to book an appointment. Ease my way. Make it easier for patients to come into the Providence ecosystem. And so this is what we call um, part of the on-demand health capability and online scheduling. And you get all this, the scores uh, on each per physician. You can look at reviews and whatnot. Um, some of you may be familiar that we've got a partnership with Walgreens where you're now setting up these low acuity clinics in the Walgreens. Again, this is not anything that we're necessarily doing that's unique. There are other organizations doing this, as, as, as you're well aware. Um, but it all fits in part of this digital innovation because we're not just looking at it saying, can you put the technology, for example, into a Walgreens clinic? Can you set up the clinic? The bigger question is, how do you then connect what's happening there back into the Providence ecosystem? Or do we truly need to look at Walgreens and say, they are the ugly beast that's competing with us? They are coming to take our patients away from us. We think we can partner with them. And so that's the problem we're trying to solve, is how do we integrate ourselves into a retail world in such a way that we can continue to add value not only to the retailer and the pharmacist, but also to the patient? Because if we can't solve that problem, the fact that you can stand up a clinic in a CVS or a Walgreens, that's worthless. That, that, that's meaningless. So again, coming back to what's the problem we're trying to solve. We're going back 200 years. We're starting to do house calls. And the initial pilot project has been done with physicians. The reason was the most rapid way to do the pilot was with physicians. We wanted to see what was going to be the receptivity from patients around this. What kind of conditions would they request somebody to come to their home for? And based on that, knowing that it's a physician so they could do effectively anything that a physician can do even in their clinic, we then have the data to know what kind of a licensed person do we need to actually send to the home for the majority of cases where we're going to get a call from patients. So the pilot with the physicians was not intended to show that we can send a, patient to, a physician to a patient's home. Obviously, we can do that. The question is, bless you, what's the, what's the licensure that you would need? Bless you. <laughs> I'm going to speed this up. Clearly, something's going around. Um, <laughs> what's the licensure we would need to make home, home care truly effective? How far down the licensing scale can we push that? to make it cost effective? And can we couple it with telehealth so that whomever is going into the home can be backstopped by a physician to do more if necessary? Does that make sense to everybody? So the pilot project was not intended to be scaled. The pilot project was serving the purpose of learning so we could figure out what it is that we need to scale. And the results were fantastic. This is one of my, my really, really exciting ones for me anyway. Um, this is something called Your Village, and this is, uh, you know, this is, a lot of organizations are working on this, delivering this, have, have tried this in different forms, but this is the app that you, you would have as a patient that would allow you to see everything from my lab results to what is my care plan. It's, it, it's my chart on steroids, if you will. But let me tell you what we did in the pilot project. We started by saying, <clears throat> and again, this is, you know, we're a not-for-profit, um, so we, we tend to share a lot of information. So um, I, I do this knowing that, that some of you may go, hey, that seems kind of competitive intel, but that's okay. We're fine with that because we think it's all about serving patients and, and providers. Um, clearly known data point that the woman controls most of the healthcare spend in the home. That's, that's, that's very steeped in evidence. And so we looked at it and said, yeah, we've got things to do to solve problems today. There might be a 60-year-old, there might be a 70-year-old, three chronic conditions, 14 medications. We gotta fix that. We gotta, we gotta invest in those things. And so we are making those investments. But what are we doing for 10, 15, 20 years from now? We've heard a lot of conversations today or comments about the fact that not everybody has a smartphone. They will in 10 years. Everybody will. My grandmother will, my grandfather will. Actually, it will be my children's grandfather, 
my father. My grandfather did not, but my father does have one. So when he becomes 80 years old, which is next year, he's already got a smartphone. So again, what problem are we trying to solve? If we're focused on right now today, this issue of everybody having the technology is a concern. 10, 15 years from now, not gonna be a concern. So what problem are you trying to solve? So we looked at it and said, okay, so long-term strategy, if we want to continue to evolve Providence, we want to develop tighter relationships with our patients. Mom is the way to do it. All paths lead through mom. So we developed the initial, what we call minimally viable product, a beta, a pilot, if you will, of this app that allows a woman to manage her pregnancy. And it is connected in the Epic so that the physician can say, this is what I want you to know for this week or this month of the gestation of your child. This is what I want you specifically, Mary, following. Your blood pressure is starting to creep up, so I'm gonna go give you a blood pressure cuff and I want you to enter that blood pressure in. Not gonna do that for all patients, only for Mary, because her blood pressure is starting to creep up. And I wanna start seeing you every week so we can stay on top of this. I want you to change your diet. I'm gonna go ahead and give you some things, foods to avoid, et cetera, et cetera. All of that's being pushed to the app, bi-directional communication. And, then, and it will give her also information that should draw her to the app. Would you like to see an image of what the Zygot looks like this week? Would you like to know what is developing in your fetus this week with images and whatnot? So that's just of interest. So mom wants to go and look at that. And while she's in there, the little alert pops up saying, I haven't seen your blood pressure today. So again, it's, it's about incenting the motivation, the behavior change, drawing the patient in. But here's where it gets really interesting. Fast forward, pregnancy goes well, mom delivers the baby. Or even towards the end of the pregnancy, last trimester perhaps, she's miserable. I can't speak of that other than knowing what my wife went through. Um, she's got maybe one or two other little kids running around. She needs to get milk. She needs to start preparing something for dinner for the family. Anybody remember where I said Aaron Martin came from? Want to guess where we're going with this? Hit a button, order diapers. Hit a button, order the milk. It's delivered right to your door. Why is the healthcare organization doing this? because we're trying to create that tight bond with the patient. And it's after delivery. We can deliver more diapers, we can deliver formula. We, have, we are integrating the telehealth capabilities right into this app, so if the mother is having difficulty with lactation and needs a lactation consultant, hit the button with the camera on the phone, allow a lactation consultant to monitor what's happening and provide you feedback in real time. Don't have to book an appointment. Don't have to wait days and days in misery for you and your child. Just make it instantaneous. So these are all the things. Now the, the group you see on the left, that was the, the original pilot group that used the app. Hopefully not surprising to many of you. I mean, I, I welcome when we get to the end here and, and uh, I have some questions and, and we're getting there. Um, quickly, uh, if, you, if you don't like this idea, I'd love to hear about it, but the feedback was tremendous. It was all fives out of fives. And all the commentary was, stupendous and so it's what led us to say we're on the right path keep going with this app so these are some of the things we're doing digitally I mentioned telehealth um, we have a pretty strong track record in telehealth a lot of organizations do this isn't um, or telemedicine depending on, on what vernacular you want to use but just to give you some background we're, we're in um, over about a hundred different locations now providing various telehealth services um, extending actually into six states, even though we only have presence. Um, we have bricks and mortar in five states. We're doing things in Idaho as well through telehealth. Um, we're starting to do things directly with employers for their employees uh, around wellness and low acuity care uh, through this. Um, in 2015, we did over 10,000 telehealth encounters as an organization, and this includes over 40 different teleservices in different respects across Providence. Now these are not all scaled to be systemic across the organization. That's one of the things we're working on. Um, the ones that are bolded there, stroke hospitalists and psychiatry, and then on the right hand side, Health Express um, and into primary care. Those are the ones we have, by direction from our clinical leaders, started scaling ubiquitously across all of Providence. And there's a massive endeavor involved in that. I'm not gonna go deep on that, but you can just imagine if any of you have any, any knowledge of what goes on in telehealth, the cross-state licensing and, and all of that associated with 
having a physician just beam in to do a service is, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, but we've taken it on. Um, we have a team in the group that do nothing but license and credential physicians onto what we call the call panels so that they can provide care ubiquitously throughout all of Providence and to all of our partners. So we make this available to organizations we don't own or don't have an affiliation with. For example, we do this a lot with critical access hospitals. And the reason is, strategically as an organization, go back to the bricks and mortar I talked about, the only way that that bricks and mortar becomes effective going into the future as we see it is if we continue to drive the acuity level up for every patient in every bed. If we can help a critical access hospital keep a patient, it actually helps our bottom line. That's entirely counter to what a lot of organizations strategically do with telehealth. They use it as a way to suck patients out of that partner site into their own ecosystem. We're doing just the opposite because we're trying to drive the acuity up. Um, and I want to go through an example um, of this thing called telehospitalist, which is um, somewhat unique, and I think it exemplifies the value propositions that we're looking at and, and how, how it exists. Really, um, uh, my tail got cut off there a little bit, but this is for Nocturnus. This is for 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. coverage for a hospital that does not have physicians on staff in-house at night. All critical access hospitals generally fall into that category. They can't afford to do it. What's interesting is many of these hospitals will staff this with on-call physicians, oftentimes family doctors from the community. And that works reasonably well, particularly if you're a physician, because the data will show, and we've done this analysis, the majority of those physicians are getting paid to sleep. They don't come in. They'll answer the phone call, and more often than not, unless it is a really, really high acuity case, they will say, well, go ahead and put the patient on holding orders and I'll deal with it in the morning. And so the patient sits in a holding status. They do not formally get admitted into the hospital. And that has a whole cacophony of downstream negative effects. Economic impact on the hospital. They can't bill for admitting the patient before midnight. They have to wait till the next day. So they've lost a day of revenue. The treatment is delayed. It lengthens the length of stay. If there are things like infections and whatnot going on, you've only allowed that to root in deeper. And so what we're now doing is we are literally beaming a hospitalist in to do the full workup and admission on the patient. Here's the result. We actually allowed the early hospitals to reduce the transfers out by 50%. And why was that happening? One is because the nurses felt so stressed out at night having this patient sitting there not being cared for, that they called to have the patient transferred to a higher acuity facility. Or, because the treatment was delayed in the morning when the family doc showed up, things had worsened to the point where they said, we can't handle this at this critical access hospital, we need to transfer the patient out. So you can imagine what that does to the income for that hospital. And these critical access hospitals, as, as many of you may know, they're fighting to survive. I mean, this is, this is survival for them. Um, increase in their average daily census of over 40%. And because they are remunerated typically on a cost plus basis, again, huge problem solver for them. Um, the billing we talked about, this allows patients that are showing up before midnight to get admitted before midnight, which allows the additional billings to happen. Again, financial. And we're not even talking about the clinical outcomes, which are all improved because treatment starts faster. The other thing is, and there is a bit of arrogance in this, not necessarily from me personally, but, but from Providence in stating this, but we're confident in this. The specialists that are at Providence, at places like Swedish Medical Center, um, and St. Vincent's in Portland, um, and some of our facilities right here in California, they're at the top of their game. They are, quite honestly, more educated, more board certifications, et cetera, than you will typically find from a family doctor in a rural community somewhere. And so the patients are just getting a higher level of care, if you will, from this model. And it's improving the clinical outcomes as well. <clears throat> but here's some of the ancillary benefits that come out of this. One of the problems that they would have, or they do have oftentimes, is when the physicians show up in the morning, they were woken several times during the night. They might even have come in. Now they've got to do a full day of clinic or rounds and then clinic. They're dead on their feet. 
And so now they're actually getting better rest and they're actually reporting they feel that they're doing better medicine during the day as a result of this. So that's one thing. They're also much more efficient because when they show up in the morning, that patient has already had everything done. Labs have been ordered, IVs are on board, everything else has already started for them. So they don't have to start from scratch, they can just pick up that patient and we do do the f full transfer to the, to the family doctor that comes in or the daytime hospitalist. The third bullet point is a big one because it was asked about earlier today on a, in a couple of the sessions. The nurses feel better. They don't feel as stressed out. They know that in a moment's notice, they just hit the button on the cart and they've got a hospitalist right there. They're not as stressed out. Turnover has started to go down at these sites as a result of this. And the patient satisfaction has gone up tremendously. In fact, one of the stories that um, uh, the medical director for this program talks about was a woman that came in. Um, she was, uh, I think it was end stage cardiac failure she was facing, had no family in the area. They were able to identify a brother and a sister that lived somewhere else. Through the telehealth infrastructure, the physician was able to connect the brother and sister with this woman to be able to allow them to say goodbye to this woman. That wouldn't have happened if the family doctor said, put her on holding orders and I'll see her in the morning. Or even if he got out of bed and came in, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. So there's some real, really nice ancillary benefits that are coming from this. So in closing, I'll just close with these two quotes that I think are, are pretty germane with respect to what we're doing. Um, and I, I won't read them to you, I'll allow you to read them yourselves. But I will challenge you to ask the question to yourselves and your organizations. Are you reacting or are you actually creating something? Are you doing it because of meaningful use? Or are you doing it because it's the right thing to do and how we're going to move to the future? <laughs> There's my answer. There's my answer. So that's, that's all I had. <laughs>